those that don't know me, you probably already know my name. And those that don't know my name, I'll leave it that way in case you don't like it. You won't know who to fuss at. <laughs> but no, I'm Ronnie West. I'm here with my lovely bride, Connie. And I was here to do the Torah portion this morning, uh, which is actually out of Genesis 32, verse 4 through 36, 43. In short, in Texas terms, it's four chapters. The verses are chapter 32 through 36. And this is about Jacob. Uh, Jacob and Esau, actually. And Jacob is, I'm going to try to give you what I call the 30,000 foot view of these few chapters in this Torah portion. Esau is leaving Padan Aram, or Iraq for practical purposes and what we understand today. And he is leaving and taking his family, all of his possessions, all of the flocks, everything with him. And they have left, and they are coming into the land where his brother Esau lives. Now, he sends an entourage ahead to go greet his brother, and they find his brother, and Esau is coming back with 400 men. You know, if somebody told me my brother was coming at me with 400 men, I'd probably get a little uh, concerned, worried, and uh, start trying to find a, a back door somewhere. So as he's doing this, he begins to divide up his people, and he puts some of the flocks, the different flocks, with their shepherds and their guides, their cowboys, widening over those flocks and watching them. And then he divides up his families, and he divides them up. As, as I see it, and based on how I see the scripture, he divides them up according to how he felt about them. First, he divided up what some scriptures refer to as his slaves, others as his concubines, which were the two handmaids of his wives. And those two handmaids come with those children that he had produced with them, they are the first, the second. The third is his wife, Leah, with the children she bore Jacob. And last is his, I'm going to call her his beloved wife, Rachel. Uh, he is the one that he had actually worked for in the first place to marry when he had been in Padan Aram and who he had worked for Laban for seven years. So long story short, they are all there. They're spread out. And he sends everybody across this little stream that uh, they are to cross. And he stays behind. So here he is one last night on the far side of the stream. Everybody else is ahead of him. And he's, he doesn't have a good night's sleep, okay? He's there wrestling with the scripture calls a man. And he wrestles all night. And as it's about to become daybreak, and he has not turned loose of this man. He finally says, bless, the man says, let me go. It is about to be dawn. He says, not until you bless me. Then he blesses Jacob. Now, you know, thinking in the worldly sense, he doesn't sit there and give him a million dollars and say, here, go down the road and, and cash this in and, you know, have fun. He blesses him by changing his name. Now, maybe you don't see that as a blessing if somebody came in and said, Dustin, I'm going to change your name from Dustin to whatever, to Mike. There you go. <laughs> that means now you have to grow a fuller beard and wear glasses. <laughs> uh, well, we got enough Steves, okay? That's all I can say. <laughs> But he changes his name from Jacob to Israel. And I've got to find my place in the other side. Because Israel actually means he who strives with God. So the man that he had been wrestling with all night was God. I believe it was probably a form of Jesus Christ. Jesus is all from Genesis to Revelation because he asked the man, what is your name? He says, why do you want to know my name? That was before he asked to be blessed. So he gets blessed with a new name. 
He had wrestled all night. Now, how many of y'all, I'll speak for myself, there have been nights I have wrestled with God over an issue all night long. And don't tell me y'all haven't either. If you don't, you're lying, and that's, we, you need to repent and come down here and talk to God. <clears throat> but all of it was for Jacob's benefit. His name was changed because you know what happens when our names are changed? It means our nature has changed. You are now from the old man to the new man, and you are now alive where you were once dead. That's the same thing that happened with Jacob. He was once dead and thought he was going to die when his brother Esau was showing up, but God changed that prior to their meeting. And so when, when this uh, takes place, God strikes him in the hip so that now he walks with a limp. Now, I can't explain all of it, but my take on that is not only did he get a new name and a new nature, he now has a new walk. He can't move like he did before. He had to slow down. How many of us need to take a step back and slow down? Yesterday, for us, well, we've had some Sabbaths, and we've tried to celebrate them, but yesterday, that was a day of rest. It was joyful in the fact that it was chillax time. And just sit back, chill out, cool your heels, and, you know, watch some biblical teachings and, you know, talk to each other on some other things that we, we talk about, just like husbands and wives talk about. And that's what God basically, to me, showed Jacob. It's time to kick back, slow down, slow your walk. You don't have to rush these things. And, you know, he'd already spent 20 years back in Padan Aram, and so now he is leaving that. He meets his brother Esau, and they go through their brotherly get-together there. Turns out Esau, even with the 400 men, was not coming to attack him. But having three brothers of my own, I can't say that, that Esau wasn't thinking that Jacob might have been doing the same thing to him. Uh, just knowing how humans think and knowing I have brothers and knowing what they would probably think, uh, they were probably both. Satan has a way of working on both sides of the fence, and he'll make both of them think the same thing and prepare for battle rather than preparing for peace. And, you know, I, I, I get that. I'm fleshly too, and I would probably think that same way with my brothers. But as it was, it was peaceful. They move on. So then Esau moves on a little further down the line in this Torah portion, and God tells him to go to Beth El. In case you don't know what Beth El is, we generally, or in growing up, we always heard it as Bethel. Well, it's really kind of a two-syllable. That's why I did that, because Beth means house of, El means Adonai, God, so it is the house of God. He told him to go there because Jacob had already been there before when he left after he had deceived Esau, which on one hand, he and his mama kind of contrived to make that deception more with Isaac than with Esau because Esau had already sold that birthright, but it didn't mean Esau wasn't still ticked off about it, and so he goes back to worship God in the same place he sought refuge before he ever left to go see Laban. So in that process, uh, one of the handmaids of Rachel passes away, Deborah, and then Rachel herself passes away, giving birth to Benjamin, and then Isaac, his father, passes away. So all of this takes place in this short span of four chapters. But in going to Bethel, on their way there, something else happens that kind of happened to his entourage on their way out of Iraq. His father-in-law, Laban, came up to their, before they ever crossed over, came up to him, caught up with him, and got on to Jacob because somebody had stolen his household idols. And so now he's looking to find the guilty party. Well, it turns out it was Jacob's wife, Rachel, of all people, right? Laban's daughter. And 
he doesn't find his idols because she was a little deceptive and clever in her own right and had it hidden. But now on their way to Bethel, what does Jacob do? He says, all right, everybody, pull out your little hidden idols and all these other foreign gods and set them aside. Now this time, rather than anybody hiding, it says everybody turned them over also with their gold rings or gold earrings. So they took all these hidden idols, these hidden foreign gods, and went and buried them under a tree. Now what that said to me was, how many hidden idols do we have? What do we have that we need to go bury, that we need to get rid of, that we need to lay aside, forget about? Uh, I'm not here to sit here and give a list of potential hidden idols. That's what each man and each woman has to determine and has to decide for themselves. It's not my place to make a judgment call on that. But if you struggle with that, I'd say there's probably plenty of people here that'd be glad to pray with you, pray for you, help you, and walk with that. I'm sure Pastor Dustin and Pastor Mike would be more than glad, Stephen, Larry, anybody else as far as that goes, Danny, be glad to help with that. So in, in closing this, so Dustin can get up here, uh, I would say let's just examine our hearts, especially coming up on Hanukkah. Let the light of the Lord shine on our hearts and expose if there be found any wicked way in us so that we can repent, bury those idols, cross over the Jabbok in the river, and be like a Hebrew that crossed over to go worship God.